If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A large crowd spread the cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God that we get it. Amen? Amen. You know, there's a lot of symbols in this story. The, the, the foal and the donkey are symbols, the palm leaves that are spread around, all kinds of different things that you look at this story and they all point and reaffirm that the, that the Messiah is here, that Jesus is the Messiah and he fulfills his Old Testament scriptures, these Old Testament prophecies. There's two sides of every good story though, right? And on the one side, we know that it's a big celebration. Everybody say celebration. celebration. But the other side of the story... It's kind of sobering. And Luke gives us a different vision, a different look at what this story is about. On Luke's version of the story, he says that there's hecklers in the crowd. And you know what? They're the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the hecklers, and they tell Jesus, tell your disciples to cut it out. Stop the party. Stop the parade. And Jesus says, are you kidding me? The likelihood of my stopping what's already in place, what's going on right now, is like expecting this. I mean, if that happens, the stones are going to cry out in their place. There's no stopping this party. They're pretty upset, though, those Pharisees. They know things are going to be radically different. They can sense changes coming, and they're pretty upset, and that's why they, get so, they, they want Jesus to stop. There's no stopping. So Palm story is a, is a story about celebration, but it's also the beginning of the end. Because what's coming next is most of you know is a story of great sorrow there's a point where Jesus is crucified in this story and this is the precursor to this Palm Sunday is the beginning of this story that starts in fact Jesus knows both sides of the story he knows that it's a celebration but he also knows that there's going to be a lot of people that betray him there'll be people that disappoint him there'll be a lot of people that end up being lost through this story and Jesus says in Luke 19.32, excuse me, Jesus says in 19.42, How I wish today, how I wish today all of you people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. And this is the one time, one of three times in the Bible that we find out that Jesus actually weeps. He is so distraught because he knows the people who are clamoring for a Messiah, who need a Messiah, and all of those who are confused and don't know what's going on, how desperately they need a Messiah, they don't realize that the Messiah is there. It's there for them right now to help them transform their lives, to make a difference. They don't realize the Messiah is there in their presence. They're blind and they are lost. Yeah, Peter's lost. Judas is lost. His disciples become even more confused and lost as the week progresses. But in the end, there's this incredible joy that happens because there's triumph. Jesus is raised from the dead. There's a victory, but that is actually next week's story. This week, I want us to focus on the hope for those who are feeling lost. And maybe that's you. Speaking of being lost, last week... I was telling a story about the ring my mom gave me, my father's ring that he wore on his hand for 60 years that they were married. And I lost that ring. Man, it was, it was uh, pretty upsetting to find out that your father, who, you know, your mom who would gave you this ring, depending on you to kind of watch it, and for eight years I did, I, was, I put it underneath my ring, and it never had come off in eight years, but a couple of Saturday mornings ago, I looked down at my hand and said, oh my, it's gone, it's gone. I told my wife, 
And she looked absolutely everywhere. We both looked every place I could have gone in the, the weeks and, and, and the days before this and, and uh, couldn't find it any place. I mean, she was relentless in her search for it. She was crying about it and felt terrible. So did I. And it was a, a day or two later that all of a sudden I had a vision. You see, you may have known that the church was on a mission trip up to Mexico Beach. I'd brought those 17 kids up there and adults, and we'd gone up there doing some great work. And the sleeping arrangements weren't so hot, and so I'd get up really early, and I started working in the dark. And I went to the, the van that we rode up on to, to, uh, to get something out of the van, and I noticed something kind of fell out of my hand. And, and all of a sudden, I had that vision again of that happening. And I turned to my wife and said, So, Gloria, I think I know where that ring is. It's about 600 miles from here, sitting in the dirt in Mexico Beach. Come on, right? But I told everybody last week, right after church, we're going to get in that, our truck, and we're going to drive up there, and we're going to look for it. And that's what we did. And we drove and we drove, and along the way, we said some prayers about our journey and about our kids, and, and, and we said a few prayers about finding this ring. It was really important to us. And when we got there... We immediately got down on our hands and knees and started looking for the ring. And we found sticks and debris. I found a centipede that wanted to bite me. Uh, but we couldn't find the ring. But we kept looking. And all of a sudden, a woman, I didn't know her at all, she came along and said, what are you guys looking for? I said, I'm looking for my dad's ring. And she was so moved by our searching for this lost ring that she got down on her hands and knees and started looking too. And it wasn't too much later that all of a sudden she said, look, I found I found something, and she held up, unfortunately, she held up a, a, a clamp for conduit for electrical, and I said, well, no, that's not it. That's something I could have lost, though. In fact, that would be the kind of thing that I would have reached into the van for, and it might have fallen out of my hand, and I thought, well, well, maybe that is what fell out of my hand. And frankly, I kind of had a, I kind of lost some hope that it was going to be there. My wife kept looking, though. She doubled down on her prayers. She kept looking, but I, I'm telling you, unless God somehow intervened, unless there's divine intervention, unless God said it's going to be done, I have really got to the point where I said, I don't think we're going to find this ring. It is definitely lost. I want to tell you about a story about something else and someone else that was lost. See, there's a parable in Luke about the lost son. You see, in this particular parable, Jesus tells us this son had lost everything that was important. I mean, he had everything, and he lost everything. He was the son of a, of a wealthy uh, a farmer, and, and uh, they're doing really well. And all of a sudden, his, he, he goes into the world, and he loses his dignity, his morality, his, his ethics. He lost his self-esteem. He lost absolutely everything. It's called the parable of the lost son. It's a powerful story. And maybe some of you know the story from the Bible, and maybe some of you know this story firsthand. Maybe you're one of those people that have lost everything, and you understand what that would feel like to lose everything in your life that's important. Well, as the parable goes, the young man approaches his dad, and he says, but Dad, I'd like to have my inheritance early. I see the world, and I, and I just want a taste of it. And his father unlike me, gave his son money in advance because I would never do that. But he does. He gives his kid the money and, and, and he runs off the money as fast as he can and he runs straight into hell. I mean, literally. He, 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 he does things that are just unbelievable with the money that he has in his hands. See, it's similar to what we do. We are given a choice by God. We have free will to make choices and make decisions of what we're going to do with the gifts that we have. And a lot of people choose to waste them. A lot of people choose to spend the gifts in ways that are not pleasing to God and harmful to themselves. It's a choice that we are given. But there's always consequences for our choices. Amen? I mean, you do things, you're given a lot of things to work with, but someday you've got to pay the price if you're not doing the right thing. There are consequences. Now, the young man makes choices that leads him to a very, very dark place. You see, he saw the world like a big, juicy apple, and he wanted to have a bite out of it. 
And he had one bite. It tasted really good. That sensation you get when you bite into a really good apple. It tastes really good at the beginning. But he had another. And another. And another. And he kept gnawing at that apple till it got down just to the core. And have you ever bitten into the core of an apple? It's kind of, it's kind of bitter, isn't it? It doesn't taste very good. And here's something else interesting about apples. The moment that you bite into them, you ever notice that they start rotting? I mean, if you bite into a green apple, it's like you look at it again, it's like, dang, I'm not eating this. The thing's rotten already, right? And they turn brown instantly almost. Hey, actually, they do. They turn instantly brown. They begin to rot. And see, we bite into that same apple. That apple is really temptation is what I'm talking about. We'll bite into that apple, and all of a sudden, just like the apple, our lives begin to deteriorate quickly. And yet many keep biting. Many go for a second and a third bite and keep working on the apple until they finally hit the core. And for a lot of people, that core is actually already rotten. Some people call out for God. At that moment, which is like the rock bottom, when they finally hit that core, rotten core, and they realize that they look at themselves and they go, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and they just simply say help me Lord help me Jesus I can't do this anymore others just keep eating they'll take another bite even if the core is rotten they'll keep eating and they finally become sick and die from their mistakes maybe you've already prayed for somebody like that today maybe you prayed for somebody in your family that has overdosed on drugs or is struggling with some type of brokenness that is just more than they can handle and they they can't take it and it kills him. So yeah, he's had enough, this kid. This young man in our story has had enough, and he finally, he calls out to God, please, God, help me. And he con concocts his story of what he's going to tell his father when he gets home. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell my dad that I'm not going to do that anymore, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain to my father that, listen, uh, no matter what it is that you have me do, I don't have to live in the house. I don't even have to be your son. I'm just so delighted to get out of this pigsty I'm in. I'm coming home, and I, I just want him to, I hope he welcomes me home. And he sets off on the journey towards home. The Bible tells us, though, before he even gets there, that a long ways off in the distance he's spotted, and the father runs to the son. I don't know about you. I wouldn't have given my money, my money, uh, my kid any money, and I'm definitely after he spends it all. I'm not going after him. I'm just, I know me, right? But God doesn't work that way. And thank God. Thank God God doesn't operate like that. Does things differently. You're right. He reaches out for his son, and he welcomes him with open arms. And here's the point of the parable that's so important to realize. Did you know that along that whole journey that his son had been on, the father had been with him. He'd been praying for him. He'd been with him while he was in the pigsty. He was with him while he was spending all the money on the worst of things, the most evil of things. He was with him every step of the way. And he's with you. When you're lying or cheating or doing something that's broken, if you're drinking or drugging or hurting somebody else or hurting yourself, God is with you. He knows every step you take. He knows every action that you're making. He knows you. He watches over you. And he's got his arms around me. And that's the realization many of us don't have is that while we are making our mistakes, God is watching everything we're doing. And yet... The amazing power of his grace and the depth of his love, he welcomes us home anyway. All we have to do is ask, and he will be there. That's an amazing God, amen? I mean, that is an amazing God, amen? Wow. We're lost, but he knows exactly where we are. He knows how to find us. You know, I mentioned earlier how I had given up on finding the ring ran out of patience whatever and I had gone inside to start working on some projects and I was kind of monkeying around for a while there and I know my wife's out there looking for the ring and I, I figured I'll go back out there and give her a little encouragement and, you know and actually I was thinking you know and tell her hey honey hey, it's not here come on come in inside and work with your husband now drop everything else and let's play with some power tools okay and that's what I was going to tell her but I saw her out there, and she was on her hands and knees. And I asked her, how's it going? And in the, I mean literally, the moment I asked her how she's going, she stands up and says, well, let me have you 
tell it in her own words. Let me have her tell it in her own words what, what happened next. But before we go there, let me tell you, some people are not going to believe it. Some people are not going to believe the power of prayer. Some people are not going to believe the power of God's grace, His amazing grace. But I'm going to tell you right now, you decide for yourself what happens next. You found the ring. It's amazing. Put it back on my hand. Why did you break that thing? Persistent and just keep praying. Praying, 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 talking to God. Lend me your eyes, God. Let me see it. Let me see it. There I can't believe you found that. I it's found the ring. I found the okay, ring. Okay, which one of us gave up? You did. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Uh, Take it off now and put it somewhere safe. Amen. Find the ring. Amen. Hey, she's going to kill me, but pull up that shot that I brought you of her hand, of her beautifully manicured fingers that are, that are dirt stained, right? She's got her hands in the dirt looking for this ring. You know the likelihood of finding a ring 600 miles away that's been sitting outside for a couple of weeks. Kids have been trampling over it. The rains have come and to bury that thing. It was not on the surface. It was under the ground when she found this ring. No, no, no. I'm, I, I'm just, I'm blown away that it's found. Blown away. And I asked my wife, what was, I mean, you couldn't find it. We found this other little thing. It was probably what kept you looking for. Why were you still searching? And she said these words. She said, there was a holy power driving me to keep looking and digging. A holy power. And it was like this intense physical pressure pushing me to just keep going. That blows me away. And it meant so much to us. And we got a little glimpse, a little glimpse of the persistence of Jesus to find us when we're lost. We got a glimpse of it. And then it was found, man. I told you, I, I knew if we found that thing, I said, man, we're just going to explode with joy. And we did. We're both just crying and hugging each other. And it's like, you know, then she slapped me a couple of times for losing in the first place. But after that, it was like, you know, amen. It was awesome. She didn't hit me. My father's ring was lost, but then it was found. What an incredible feeling. And we got another glimpse of what it must be after Jesus has been looking for us, one of his lost sons or lost daughters, and he finds us, and we got a glimpse of that. It was unbelievable joy. I don't know if it was a miracle or just, it was just an amazing thing, but it was truly a gift to us that we got that ring back. The gift that we received actually was not the ring. You see, the gift we received is that we got acknowledgement that we had an overwhelming proof that God hears our prayers and that they are answered. The gift that we received that there's an amazing God who has amazing grace. And that if you ask and reach out to God, He will take what is lost and it will be found. And that may be you right now. So I am praying, and I am praying, God, fervently that you hear the voices of the people today. And I know he's listening, that you'll actually talk to him today and say, listen, I'm broken, I'm hurting, I have no way to go where to go except down. I've eaten from the core of the apple. I've got nothing left of me. Please, God, save me from myself and where I am. I am praying that you hear that you can be found. I am praying for you. Because it is amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Let's pray about that while the band plays. Lord, thank you for this amazing grace. And I know that there's somebody here that needs to come forward and be blessed. I know that there's somebody here today that is feeling so lost and so hurt and so broken that they need to feel your presence and your holy anyone that needs to be saved today, that needs to be
be healed today that is feeling broken and locked up. Come forward now and be in his arms. He's a holy God, a loving God, a God that will walk with you no matter what mess you might be in right now. He is with you. Come forward and feel his presence. If you've lost someone in your life, come forward because you can find the healing grace of Jesus. If you have a relationship that's broken, come forward because you can feel his presence and you can walk together with God through whatever it is that's hurting you. He is an amazing, loving God. Come and receive this gift. Come and receive his power. Come and receive his love. It is yours for the day. I know it's hard to sometimes believe, but this story is given to you that you might believe in that power. He helped me find that ring so you would know that its power is unbelievable to make changes in your life. As we sing, come forward and receive His amazing, amazing grace. Sing with me. Amazing.